Welcome back. Now, the next Conservative candidate for Mayor of London isn't your stereotypical Tory. He's a former youth worker who's worked with communities blighted by issues including knife crime. Sean Bailey wants the top job at City Hall and he joins us now. Thank you very Morning. much for being with us. Well, we said a bit there in the introduction, but you're not, you know, the, the person that people always think of when they think of what a stereotypical Conservative is. You know, you're brought up by a single mum on a council estate. Why did you become a Conservative? I think for me, because life's about forward progress and would help people move forward. I like the idea of being independent and being responsible and they for me are, are core Tory values. I don't hold too much that I'm not a typical Tory on one sense, maybe not, but those values of decency, hard work, they're universal worldwide. So I, for me, actually, in my heart, I am a very typical Tory. OK, fair enough. Um, now, you've said that one of your priorities, if you become mayor, is to try and tackle crime. So do you think that London is more or less safe than when you grew up? is definitely less safe, that is beyond doubt. When I talk, I've been a youth worker for 25 plus years. When we were younger, we used to travel across London, you know, you'd get on the seven bus, go to Oxford Street. I remember I discovered London by riding along the Grand Union Canal. There's no way the kids I work with now would do that. And why not? Because they'd be crossing several or eight different people's territories and, and right now that would literally be life-threatening. You'd be looking at potentially being attacked, murdered, and we focus so hard on knife crime, but there's burglaries on the rise, all those kind of things. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that London is more dangerous now than it's been for years. And why is years. that? There's a number of factors. I think some of the main reasons is we haven't pushed down enough on crime. So in a London that I would be building, we'd be having criminals under pressure, not communities. We don't intervene early enough with crime. We're not supporting young people enough to learn how to avoid those things. When I grew up, resilience was easier to come by, our communities were more resilient and as I became a youth worker, my main thing was to teach people, Here's, here are the pitfalls, here are the things that will drag you into crime, here are the outcomes that you don't want. It meant we had to have many tough conversations, some of which weren't particularly polite. So, you know, they were, they were tough conversations for communities in tough places, but it meant that we would keep our young children safe. That is harder now. I mean, coming down hard on crime, what do you mean by that? Is this like stop and search? Is it longer jail sentences? What is it? It's all of the above. So the first thing is you need to get more bobbies on the beat because there's a perception that the roads are dangerous. That London Hang on, is... more bobbies on the beat? I mean, it was the Conservatives, wasn't it, who cut the numbers of uh, policemen on the beat? I mean, 3,000 fewer police officers in London compared to 2010. But that's, but that's about police activity. That's about choices, isn't it? So if you look at City Hall now, we're about to have a 37% rise in staff we should have spent much, if not all, of that money on police. I've written a plan to give us a 1,000 extra bobbies on the beat and 800 detectives with the money we currently have. And the reason I've done that is there's two things. But well, it's not just about City Hall, though, is it? It's also well, it is... about the national government but in, the but in priorities London, in uh, London, of the Conservative government since 2010. In London, it is about City Hall, isn't it? Because we have the power to make a change. I'm, I'm not in politics to, to have arguments about the past. It's about what we do going forward. We have the money right here, right now. For more than two years, myself and other people have been saying to the mayor, you can produce more officers for the place that you are responsible for. And we've dragged our heels and here we are. And why I talk about Bobby's on the beat, the first thing we have to support frontline policing and also police staff, the people who do the back office stuff, because it allows more police to be out on the street. And also we need more detectives, because the problem in London in particular is criminals are now believing they're getting away with crime, so they keep doing it. They were told by the mayor it would take 10 years to solve violence, so our children are now arming ourselves because they've been told they won't, it, it will be 10 years before any change. Have you ever been tempted to carry a knife? I'm, I'm lucky I haven't been. I grew up in an area and a time, because I'm I, I used to be a youth. I grew up at a time where it just didn't feel that dangerous. I didn't need to do that. And I grew up in a tight-knit community where we knew who the bad boys were and we could avoid them. OK. Uh, now, I want to address some things that you've said in the past, um, because they have come out in the media. You've had a lot of criticism for some of the comments that you made around a decade ago. Now, that was a while ago, but you were, you know, let's be honest, you were in your 30s. You weren't like a young boy at the time. Okay. Um, so I just want to have a look at one thing first. This is what you said in 2005 about women who are good looking or girls who are good looking if a girl appeals to one that way she'll appeal to all of them she'll tend to have been around i mean for me that's quite depressing it's kind of that age-old thing about you know women basically being blamed for having sex so two things i never actually said that that was me having a conversation with someone but let's be clear i'm talking about a very poor community facing very you're, talk, you're talking about you say you said that when you talk to teenagers about sex you warn them that it's not all about if they're looking clean then 
she'll, she'll be less likely to have an affection. If a girl appeals to one that way, she'll appeal to all of them. She'll tend to have been around. That's, that's around myth-busting, because we're talking about boys who live in a very sexualised environment. It's traded as a, as a way of being popular or not. And like I said, you're talking about the poorest communities, you know, dealing with the toughest issues, and it's, it's people like me who are on the front line having those conversations. What makes me laugh about your slick career politicians who run around saying nice things about communities? They always talk about youth work. What do they think youth workers are doing? What kind of conversations do they think we're having that other people won't have with young people? That's what's being talked about. It's the language, though, isn't it, about women? Of course. It's, it's, it, was, it, was it the smoothest language? Of course not. Of course not. And if, if anybody's sat there thinking, well, why did he say that? You remember, you're talking about 10, 15 years ago when I was faced with young people who have been stabbed, murdered in all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So the language isn't the smoothest. But I'm not... I'm not, a, I'm not sitting at home thinking, well, what will look good on Sky? I'm thinking, how can I get across to these people? And, of course, the young people I'm speaking to, I'm having to mirror the language that they're using. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that you said um, about single mothers as well, I'm quite interested to talk to you about this, because, of course, you were brought up by a single mother. Mm -hmm. uh, you said many of the first single mums were housed in my part of London, reassuring them that it was acceptable, even desirable, for mothers to have babies on their own. So is it acceptable, do you think, to...? A single mother. Oh, sorry, uh, there's another one. I forgot that. Um, it, you went on to say that that assumption is flawed because we now know that a child growing up without a father is so much more likely to be disadvantaged. So let's, let's take these two things. So the first thing is about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. We had a system, and in many ways we still do now, that encourages poor communities to make themselves vulnerable in order to, to receive benefits or to be supported. Mm -hmm. That's why, for instance, if you look at City Hall, one of the biggest mistakes we've done, the mayor's removed the target for family housing. So Ken had one, Bryce had one, um, Sadiq Khan has removed it. Those are the kind of things that put people in, 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 those, in those situations that you have to make a decision. Do I make myself vulnerable or not? And for me, that's terrible. That's why I got in, in, involved in politics. And the whole thing about growing up in a single family, I grew up in a single parent family. I work with many people in single parent families. And the statistics will show that you are much more likely to be exposed to, to poverty. And no matter which side of the political divide you're on, you will know that poverty is a tough, tough nut to crack. So, again, when you're having conversations with the people who are, who are having to make these decisions on a daily basis, you have okay. to have a realistic conversation. OK, thank you very much. We're out of time, sadly. Thank, thank you. you.